Good evening, friends, and a very warm welcome to our evening service here at the Tron Church. And uh, particularly if you're a visitor here amongst us, uh, you are more than welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Let me start by saying some words from the book of Revelation about the eternal church of the Lord Jesus. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Well, let's begin by singing together hymn number 568. And this is a great hymn about the Church of God. 568, Church of God, Elect and Glorious. Well, let us bow our heads together and we'll have some prayer together. And together we lift our minds and our hearts to the Lord, conscious that our need for him is always great, our dependence upon him is absolute, and knowing that we look to him to bless us and to strengthen us so that we might serve him and indeed declare his praises, the one who has brought us out of darkness into light. Let me read some verses now from 
the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, where Paul tells the Ephesians in what terms he is praying for them. For this reason, he says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for the words of the Apostle Paul and the way that he speaks indeed the very words that the Lord Jesus has given him. And we think of him praying for his dear friends, those he knew well at Ephesus, the Christians, praying that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith and that they, rooted and grounded in love, might have the strength, the ability, the perseverance, the understanding to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which is greater than knowledge. And we thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that the love of Christ is something that is far bigger than our minds could ever encompass. But we know that it is long and deep and broad and high. That it is, in a sense, like a great territory that we're able to explore and get to know and come to love more deeply. We think of the love, dear Heavenly Father, which initiated by your heart, sent our Lord Jesus to the earth to take upon him all that he had to do. We think of you asking him, indeed commanding him and charging him to leave the bliss and glory and delight of the heavenly places so as to take human form and flesh upon himself, to be born in humble circumstances as a weak, vulnerable human baby, we think of you, dear Father, with your charge to him that he should live in the land of Israel and be indeed a member of the Jewish race, a descendant of David, the great king, so that he should be the king of David's line who rules and reigns forever. And we think of him, dear Father, being brought up there in that humble home in Nazareth, learning to make tables and chairs and beams and rafters, learning the skill of the carpenter's trade. We think of him learning through those years of preparation, learning the hearts of men and women, learning to love them and to understand them. We think of his great knowledge of the scriptures even as a boy of 12, when he surprised and astonished the teachers of the law in the temple. And then we think of him finally, dear Father, entering that crucial and critical phase of his earthly life, when baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, and when he heard and others heard the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son, he then undertook the teaching of those three years when he so patiently explained the gospel to so many people, when he loved them, when he spoke clearly when he displayed his understanding of human nature so deeply and wonderfully. And then, dear Father, turning his face decisively and resolutely to Jerusalem, he went there knowing what lay before him and not flinching from it because he knew the purpose of his coming, that he had to go there, that he had to be rejected and held in contempt by the religious leaders and indeed by many others. And then eventually to be crucified, to carry upon his own shoulders the weight and the penalty of the sin of all of us. We thank you so much for it, and thank you that in all this he expressed his love and his commitment, a love so deep that we can never comprehend it, 
But our prayer, dear Father, is that as we think further about that love and commitment and purpose of the Lord Jesus this evening, so you will build us up and enable us to be filled with all the fullness of God as the Apostle Paul teaches us. So, dear Father, bless us tonight. Strengthen us, we pray. <clears throat> we ask that any here tonight who are particularly bowed down or disheartened because of uh, the events of their life might be strengthened and built up and given fresh courage to persevere and to do so with joy. Be with us, we pray. Teach us and strengthen us. And we ask it in the name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let me say once again how good it is to see you all here tonight. And for those who might be afflicted with a little thirst at the end of the service, there will be served teas, coffees, and other delicious beverages downstairs. So do go down and enjoy that. It gives us a chance to shake hands and to get to know new people and to get to know old people, ones that we already know uh, better. And that is part of our being here, isn't it? To encourage each other in the Christian life, which is hard. Uh, but to, to have our fellowship and our loving friendship together and to build it up uh, is, is a great privilege and blessing for us. So do stay, if you can, afterwards to talk. And um, We're looking forward to Terry McCutcheon preaching to us tonight, episode 2 of Ephesians chapter 2, and I shall be reading that chapter in just a few moments' time. But before we, we listen to the word of the Lord, let's sing together again. And our next hymn is number 713 in our hymn book, 713. A mind at perfect peace with God. Oh, what a word is this. A sinner reconciled through blood. This, this indeed is peace. Number 713.
Well, now we come to the reading of God's Word. And let's turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. And if you have one of our big hardback Bibles, you'll find that on page 976. Page 976. I know that Terry will be particularly speaking from verses 11 to 22, but he's asked me to read the whole chapter so that we can get the flow of the Apostle Paul's thinking. So Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, and a great passage it is. Well, let's uh, sing together again, and we'll turn in our hymn books to number 601. Number 601. As we come before you to pray, we feel our sins will make you turn away, yet we long to know that we have been forgiven, and your smile is resting on your church again. Now, friends, just watch out in the chorus. In the chorus, we slightly change the words at this church, don't we? And those who lead worship should know exactly what the change of the words is, if they can remember it. It's, I think we'll have a go. Have a look at the chorus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that he might die. Whoever trusts in him. That's what we sing, isn't it? And you'll find that goes with the music better than singing what is put here. Whoever trusts in him shall find eternal life. I'm, I'm right in saying, Richard, good. Whoever trusts in him shall find eternal life. Well, let's keep that firmly in our minds, and we shall sing this with joy. 601, off we go. <clears throat>
now our offering will be taken up for the Lord's work here and further afield as well. And our musicians will play, play for us while this is happening. Let us pray together again. And to help us to pray and to lead us into our prayers, I'll read some verses from the Apostle Peter from his second letter, the third chapter, when he speaks of the day of the Lord and the great future in the new heavens and the new earth. The day of the Lord, writes Peter, will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for these great and awesome truths that the Apostle Peter has revealed to us here. And we're conscious that he is encouraging Christian people to not only wait for the coming of the day of God, but to hasten it and to live the kind of lives that are pleasing to you, our dear Father, lives of holiness and godliness as we wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God. And then, dear Father, we think with joy of the promise that you have given to your people that the new heavens and the new earth will come, and indeed we shall be, we who trust in Christ, shall be part of this new and wonderful creation in which righteousness dwells. Our dear Father, we're very conscious that righteousness is not at home in the old heavens and the old earth, the old creation in which we're living. Indeed, righteousness has a very tenuous foothold in the old creation. We're conscious of this, dear Father, conscious of the difficulty in which we live because we are surrounded by and pressed by uh, the standards of the devil and the lies of the devil. And we say to you freely, dear Father, how difficult it is for us to live a righteous life, the kind of life that pleases you. But we pray because our Apostle Peter encourages us to do this. We do pray that you will help us 
to hunger and thirst for holy and godly and righteous living more and more. We pray that you'll help each of us to address ourselves and to deal with those parts of our lives and our thinking and our, our feelings which are not in line with your will, the things of which you disapprove. Help us to, to wrestle with sin and indeed, by your grace, to learn increasingly to stand up to temptation. And we pray that you will be pleased with us as you look down upon us. We ask you as well, dear Father, to sustain in holiness and godliness those Christian people who are living in the most difficult circumstances. We think of those especially again this evening who are living in the eastern part of Ukraine, living in fear, in terror, having to leave their homes. We think of Christian people as well who are living in the the parts of the Middle East where ISIS is seeking to establish some kind of uh, a fundamentalist Islamic state. And we do pray that you will give them st strength and grace to persevere in the midst of everything that is coming at them. Pressures to which we, living in this country, are strangers and simply don't know the kind of fear and difficulty that they're having to live with. Dear Father, may your church throughout the world grow in godliness and the desire to live this kind of life. And we pray that through the preaching of your word tonight, we may learn more about the true nature of the church for which Christ died, that you might deepen in our hearts a love for your people, both in our own congregation, but as we look around the country and around the world as well. Give us a heightened and growing sense of the privilege that is ours to belong to the people of God. Give us a love, dear Father, both for the Lord Jesus, but also for his people. Give us the desire to build others up who are Christians, to show love and support and graciousness and kindness and forgiveness and hospitality and everything that will help to make their lives better and more fruitful and more rich in their service of the gospel. So, dear Father, have mercy upon our church as well. Lead us forward, especially in these days of change, as we look forward to the use of new premises and refurbishment next door. And as we look ahead over the months, please help us more and more to grow into the kind of congregation that displays the Christian life with joy, with perseverance, and in such a way as draws other people to Christ and makes them ask, who is this Saviour? that these people serve. We want to serve him too, if being a Christian looks like this. So, dear Father, build us up and have mercy upon us, and all these things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn in our hymn books now to number 566, 566. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Number 566, before we have the sermon.
invite you to take your Bibles and to turn with me again to Ephesians chapter 2, which you will find on page 976 of the Pew Bible. 976. And as you do so, let me say a word of prayer. Make the book live to us, O Lord. Show us yourself with, within thy word. Show us ourselves and show us our Saviour. And make the book live to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Recently I was, I was visiting a lady from the church um, and she'd been a nurse in a, a missionary hospital in Kenya for three years in the, the late 50s and the early 60s. And after these three years, she, she then moved to serve in another missionary hospital in South Africa. And she spent another three years there in South Africa during the, the middle 60s. And this was during the, the apartheid. And this lady witnessed firsthand how people were brutally treated all because of the colour of their skin. It's hard to imagine how oppressed a, a black South African must have felt during 1948 to 1994 when the system of apartheid was legally enforced. If you're not already aware, apartheid meant that if you were black, you were provided separate services to white people, all of which were inferior. If you were black, you attended a different school, if you attended school at all. If black, you had different medical care, if any, any medical care at all. In fact, some pub public services wouldn't be available to you at all. There were beaches that you couldn't go on, drinking taps that you couldn't drink from, and churches you couldn't attend. If we asked a black person living, living under apartheid to describe what it was like, they would probably speak about the awfulness, the awfulness of separation and alienation and the shame of being a stranger to everything that was good. We all probably find it extremely difficult to even begin to imagine what living under these horrific conditions must have been like. But in the passage we're looking at together this evening, the Apostle Paul highlights to the church at Ephesus that that was exactly their former spiritual position, separated, alienated, and strangers to all that was spiritually good. That was how they were living before the gospel and the grace of God came to them. Over the course of this evening and, and next Sunday, Paul and I, and that's Paul the Brennan, not Paul the Apostle. <laughs> Paul and I will, will seek to expound the, 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 this half of chapter 2 and, and all of chapter 3. You may remember, though I doubt it very much, that we've done a similar thing a couple of months ago with chapter 1 and the, and the first half of chapter 2. Ephesians is all about the church. It is the gospel of the church, as one writer put it. And Philip Copeland, who is known to most of, us, most of us here, was brought up here in this church and spent two years here as an apprentice. Philip helped me to see that this letter divides into three sections. The first section, the wealth of the church. Chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 21. In this section, Paul unpacks the riches of God's grace that he has showered upon his people. And Christ they have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In this world of, of darkness that is suffering under the curse of sin and hell, sin and the fall, God is creating a new humanity in Jesus Christ. And God has given his new humanity a name, the church. And the church consists of those who, who have been saved from both Jew and Gentile, non-Jewish backgrounds, and are now united as one in Christ. The grace that God has showered upon them is to shape and to master the way that they live. So the wealth of the church is to shape the walk of the church. Chapter 4 verse 1 to chapter 6 verse 9. Paul unpacks the, the moral behavior that comes with being God's new humanity. Christians have already been saved and made alive with Christ. Therefore, we are to live like it. Be what you are, says Paul. You are already God's children who have been shown immeasurable grace. 
So now live your life under this new, new identity. Every part of life, from public to private, from speech to sexuality, from life at work to life at home, everything is to be used for, for God's glory and shaped by his grace. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, Paul, Paul says. God's new humanity, the church, is to stand united in Christ and under the word of God. They are to live distinctly different lives from the world around them because this is part of God's plan. Paul urges them to live this way because it's in the everyday relationships of church life that God's people face the attacks of the power of darkness. In the great climax of the letter, Paul describes the warfare of the church. That great passage about the armor of God. The armor of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ, both applied to our belief and our behavior. We are to put on the full armor of God, to put on the gospel, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, the wealth of the church, the walk of the church, and the warfare of the church. It's good stuff, isn't it? You should text Philip Copeland or send him an email and encourage him. Well, we're still very much in that first section of the letter, the wealth of the church. In chapter 1, Paul has outlined the spiritual privileges of the church in Christ. The past privilege, the past privilege of election in Christ. Chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. Before the foundation of the world, before creation, before time existed, to when God only himself existed, God did something. He chose us in Christ, totally undeserving as we are. He chose us that we should be holy and blameless before him. The past privilege of election, the present privilege of adoption. Verse 5 to 8 of chapter 1. God has adopted us as his children through Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed through his blood. We have been forgiven according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. Past privilege, present privilege, but also future privilege of unification. Verse 9 and 10 of chapter 1. God has made known to us the mystery of his will for the future. His plan, his purpose, which he has set forth in Christ. A plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, all things in Christ. Things in heaven and things in the earth. And the scope of this unification is outlined in verses 11 to 14. These privileges, these blessings belong equally to Jewish believers and to Gentile believers. People who are not Jews. And this theme is picked up in chapter 2. Having outlined our spiritual privileges in Christ, Paul now in chapter 2 goes on to outline our spiritual position in Christ. Chapter 2 falls into two halves. Two halves that outline two great realities that God has accomplished for his people, his church, his new humanity in Christ. In verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2, God has made alive in Christ those who were dead, the grave clothes of sin have been replaced by the grace clothes of Christ. In verses 11 to 22, God has made one in Christ those who were divided, Jew and Gentile, non-Jew, together making one new people of God, the new humanity in Christ. Our focus this evening will be the second half of chapter 2. And so under our consideration this evening, of verses 11 to 22, God making one in Christ, those who were divided. In this half of chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians that separation, alienation, and being strangers to all of God's covenant promises was their position before they heard the gospel and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does in this section we're looking at this evening what he did in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2. He again reminds the Ephesians of their former condition, who they were and what they were before they became Christians. As we saw last time, 
Paul doesn't do this to make the Ephesians feel bad about themselves. He isn't one of those people who likes to say to others, remember who and what you are for the purpose of keeping them down. No, Paul reminds them of their former condition because he knows that if they fail to grasp the awfulness of life outside of Christ, they would never grasp and enjoy how privileged they were in Christ. And where this was the case for the Ephesians, so too is the case for us. Unless we, we remember what we once were, we will never fully appreciate what we are now. Paul follows the same pattern as the first half of chapter 2. He reminds the Ephesians of what life was like, what happened, and what life is like now. And this could be summed up in three words. What life was like, alienation. What happened, reconciliation. And what life is like now, unification. So firstly we have in verses 11 and 12, the Gentiles' terrible plight, alienation. The Gentiles' terrible plight, alienation. If you look at verse 11, Paul reminds them that before trusting in Jesus, they had nothing to mark or identify them as belonging to or knowing God. They weren't like the Jews who had the covenant mark of circumcision, the outward sign which identified them as God's people. And although Paul points out in verse 11, circumcision was only an external sign done in the body by, by the hands of men, it was more than the Gentiles had. With respect to God, Gentiles had nothing. In verse 12, he, he mentions five consequences of what this meant for them. And every consequence meant that they were without something. They were without something. Firstly, the Ephesians' former position meant that they were without Christ. At that time, they were separate from Christ. That is, they were formerly Christless. The Ephesians worshipped the, the goddess Diana. Before coming to the gospel, they knew nothing about Christ. Unlike the Jews, they had no thought, no expectation, and no hope of a coming Messiah. And this too is the position we were in before hearing in the gospel what God had done in Christ. Remember back to when we had no comprehension of who Jesus was and what Jesus had done? Think how empty and meaningless life was then. I remember it only too well. How as a young man I, I knew I was empty. Wishing something or, or someone might come along and change things. Like those in Ephesus, I had no hope. No thought and no expectation of a saviour. I wasn't waiting on a Christ. In fact, the only Christ I ever heard about was the one who, whose name my parents cursed daily. And sadly, this is the story for most in our city today. Without Christ, separate from Christ, Christless. The only time they hear his name, the only time they use his name, is when it's been used as a curse word. Try to think of the Ephesians listening to Paul's letter being read out. And as it got to the bit about their, their, their former state being separate from Christ, they must have been so grateful that Paul had came to their city and shared the gospel. Paul's preaching of the gospel took them from being sinners in Ephesus, separate from Christ in chapter 2, verse 12, to chapter 1, verse 1, saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ, and this is what God is still doing today in the lives of many who hear the gospel. They go about day to day without a gospel and without any expectation of a Messiah who could save them. Then the word of faith comes to them. The gospel is shared and they go from separation from Christ to being the faithful in Christ. Perhaps that's something that will happen in the life of someone here this evening. I so hope so. The second consequence Paul mentions in verse 12 about the Ephesians' position before becoming Christians is they were without citizenship, without citizenship, alienated from the commonwealth, the citizenship in Israel. This is an odd statement and we, we might be wondering what it means. Well, it's a statement that, that means exactly what it says in the tin. As Gentiles, the Ephesians were excluded from the, the nation to whom God 
had revealed himself. Remember back to Genesis 12, when God called Abraham, the father of the faith. He called him to go to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth, or in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham's seed, Abraham's offspring were the Jews, the nation of Israel. God also gave them his laws and his blessing. Israel was God's nation in a way that was not true of any Gentile, non-Jewish nation. Gentile nations were without citizenship, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The third consequence, they were without covenants. Without covenants. They were strangers to the covenants of the promise. The plural covenants here indicates that as Gentiles, the Ephesians were foreigners, not just to one, but to all the covenants God made. The covenant with Abraham, his covenant with Moses, his covenant with David. As Gentiles, the Ephesians knew nothing about any of this. One commentator puts it like this. These covenants were for Hebrew ears. Gentiles didn't belong to the privileged people. And generally speaking, they didn't even know God had made such promises. They were alienated strangers. Well, the blessing of the Gentiles is included in, in God's covenant with Abraham. That in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Although this was true, that the blessing of God would come to the Gentile nations. God, however, did not make any direct covenants with the Gentile nations. The Gentiles were aliens, strangers, and the Jews never let them forget it. Many of the Pharisees would pray daily, O oh God, I give you thanks that I am a Jew and not a Gentile. What a position the Ephesians were in before Paul brought them the gospel. In relation to God, they were ignorant and had nothing. Let me emphasize this again. This is where most people in our city are at this moment in time. Even though lots of folks in this city have Catholic or, or Protestant backgrounds, they are separate from Christ, alienated from citizenship in Israel, strangers to the covenants of the promise. And the result of all of this, in verse 12, well, Paul says the result is, Without hope. Without hope. Where most people in Glasgow would, would need the first three consequences spelled out to them, I'm sure they would fully understand what without hope means and feels like. These words, without hope, one commentator says, what profoundly empty words. Is there a better way of describing life without Jesus? Engulfed in despair, hopeless, the only hope there is, is tomorrow bright, might bring something better than today. But the reality is we know that it won't because we hoped for the same thing yesterday and it made no difference. This is people's lives. We live among many who are hopeless. And if we're sitting here this evening and we don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, we'll know this describes our lives. Without hope in life, without hope in death, in verse 12, the fifth, fifth consequence, without God, without God, Paul wants us to see that having no hope in life and in death is a direct result of being without God in this world. Absolutely desperate. And it's not the, that the Ephesians or the Gentiles, for that matter, didn't have any gods. Oh, they had gods aplenty. It was said that in Athens it was, it was easier to find a God than it was to find a man. But the Gentiles, no matter how religious, no matter how moral they were, they did not know the one true God. And it's just worth noting that the spiritual plight of the Gentiles then and unbelievers today is not caused by God. It's caused by our own willful sin. Anyone who is without God is also without excuse. As Paul writes in the book of Romans, we all know that the true God exists, but we deliberately refuse to honor him 
And this is what he writes in Romans chapter 1. Men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are, without excuse. Paul tells the Ephesians to remember that this was their life without Jesus. Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, godless. Only as we think about what we've looked at in the first three verses of chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2, will what's written in verse 8 of chapter 2 be meaningful. By grace you have been saved. The only reason the Ephesians' terrible plight changed is through what Christ done for us at Calvary, which is what Paul says in, in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near. How have we been brought near? By trying our best, by being good, by coming to the church and getting on all the rotors, by being baptised, by being evangelicals and holding all the right doctrines and all the right confessions. No. We have been brought near to God, into his covenant community, where we can enjoy all his covenant promises through the blood of Jesus alone. Paul wants us to see that it cost Jesus everything for us to receive everything. He gave his life so that we might have life. Paul's already mentioned Jesus' blood in verse 7 of chapter 1, saying we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Without the blood of Christ poured out for us in the cross, without him dying in our place, we have no hope. We stand unforgiven before a holy and just God. However, when we claim the blood of Christ, when we look to the cross and recognize what Jesus did was on behalf of my sins and that this is my only defense before God, only then can we draw near to God. Look what Paul says in verse 12 of chapter 3. Through Christ we have boldness and access to God with confidence through faith in Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. As Paul goes on from looking at the Gentiles' terrible plight, alienation, he now moves to the gospel's transforming power, reconciliation. The gospel's transforming power, reconciliation. The gospel has, has achieved reconciliation for those who knew alienation. And Paul writes that God's purpose in all of this was to bring about peace. Some of you will remember the words of the then British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain when he returned from conferences in Germany in 1938. Peace in our time, he cried. Peace with honour. He was sure he had stopped Adolf Hitler. Yet one year later, Hitler invaded Poland. And on September the 3rd, 1939, Great Britain declared war in Germany. Chamberlain's great peace mission had failed. And it seems so has the, the peace mission for Ukraine this week as well has failed. And that's what Paul is saying here. Peace in our time. Peace in our time is possible. Peace in our time is happening. Because unlike Chamberlain, Christ Jesus' peace mission did not fail. In fact, verse 14 he himself is our peace. Friends, just read that again and let that sink in. He himself is our peace. Our peace is not found in a signed document. It's not won by politicians. Our peace is in a person. Christ Jesus, the Prince of Peace. He himself is our peace. And there are two strands to, to this peace that Christ Jesus brings. First of all, God makes peace through Christ's cross between himself and us. As Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 16 of chapter 2. Jesus might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility, creating peace. However, Paul's emphasis in chapter 2 isn't only peace between God and man through the cross. His emphasis here is peace between Jew and Gentile, brought about through Christ's death on the cross. Jesus himself is our peace, we are told in verse 14. But one of the main purposes of this peace was to make us both one and has broken down in its flesh the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. Christ's purpose in dying, verse 15, was that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And this is an astonishing statement when we think of the hatred that existed between Jew and Gentile in the first century world. I wonder if we're aware how how much the Jews hated the Gentiles. Here are some examples. The Jews believed that God created the Gentiles for one purpose, as fuel for the fires of hell. Other records tell us that if a Gentile woman was was struggling and in labor, Jews were, were told not to aid her. Why? Because they were only bringing another heathen dog into the world. And it wasn't one way hatred. No, not one way. We need only read recent history to to discover how much Gentiles hate Jews. Back to that Second World War, six million Jews were exterminated. Just recently in our news, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Jews' liberation from the death camp in Auschwitz. And this hatred toward Jews is not something confined only to the past. Reports just this week have informed us that anti-Semitic attacks in Great Britain have doubled in the past year. There have always been astonishing levels of hatred between both groups. But then Jesus comes along and Jesus gives up his life, not just for Jew and not just for Gentile, but for sinners. And the result, Jewish sinners and Gentile sinners, both of whom, verse 17 says, need peace preached to them, the two become one body, the body of Christ, and we're told in verse 18, both have access through Jesus to the Father by one Spirit. Only through Jesus, who verse 15 says, in his flesh has abolished the law of commandments and ordinances. Only through Jesus can Jew and Gentile be reconciled to one another. But more importantly, only through Jesus, we're told in verse 16, Can Jew and Gentile be reconciled to God? And that's wonderful news for the Ephesians who were far off and have now been brought near. But for a Jew, it would be quite hard to stomach, quite hard to get your head around. Paul has already said that the Ephesians were without Christ, without citizenship, without covenants, without hope, without God. But the Jews, listen to what Paul says about the Jews in Romans chapter 9. They are the Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, as the Christ came the Messiah, Jesus who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. They were a people of great privilege. But the fulfillment of all these privileges was Christ. All these were merely shadowing Christ, pointing forth unto him. And Jew, just like Gentile, needed Christ. There would be no two-tier Christianity. Christ has reconciled both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And through him, we both, or we all, have access in one spirit to the Father. I don't think we have Jews and Gentiles here this evening. I think we're all probably Gentiles, non-Jews. 
But there are some of us here who have had extremely privileged upbringings, just like the Jews. We've been raised with parents who are Christians. We have been brought along to church all the days of our lives. We have sat under the teaching of the word and the preaching of the gospel. But the way for you to be part of God's family is exactly the same way as the atheist who comes in off the street. The same way as the unchurched drug addict who comes to Tron at two. And the same as maybe one of our Iranian brothers with a Muslim background who comes to the church. The way is the same for all through Christ. Jesus Christ is a great leveler for men. Paul wants the Ephesians to remember these things. He's telling them. At one time as Gentiles, they had a terrible plight. Alienation. But all this changed because of the gospel's transforming power. Bringing reconciliation for them in Christ. But Paul now ends chapter 2 in verses 19 to 22. By pointing them to God's tremendous purpose. Unification. God's tremendous purpose. Unification. C.S. Lewis once said that the church was not a show home, but a building site. And these verses at the end of chapter 2 would seem to back up what Lewis said. We have a building work of our own going on here at the church, nearing completion. And at the moment, and, and having an architect like, like Kenny Stephen on a job with his plans and drawings and, and fine eye for details has been a tremendous benefit in making one building of the two. But God's plans and purposes of unification are even more tremendous. Look back to verse 12. These Gentiles were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, godless. But look at the building work that's been going on amongst them. Look at verse 19. So then, you are no longer so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but, verse 15, one new man. Verse 16, one body. Verse 19, one nation. Gentiles are, are now fellow, fellow citizens. Verse 19, one family. Members of the household of God. And verses 20 to 22, one temple. What a tremendous purpose God has in Christ. Unification. And what he's doing in the church, he will do in the whole cosmos. He will unite all things, all things in heaven and all things on earth in Christ. And this unification happens as we are built on and built by the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, which is the testimony, their testimony of and about Christ Jesus, the word of God. Christ Jesus, who himself is the cornerstone. And as we continue to grow and mature in Christ, we are joined together. We grow together into a holy temple in the Lord. And we are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Wow. Did you know that that's what was happening when we meet together and we grow together? Gives you a different view of church, doesn't it? That we are part of God's tremendous purpose of, of unification. That's why we all need to be here. Being a Christian is a team game. It's not an individual sport. That's why we need to be here under the word, being shaped and molded and changed as we're built and shaped and joined and grow together to make this temple. God's tremendous purpose of unification. So friends, Paul wants us to remember our terrible plight as Gentiles. We were alienated from God. But because of the gospel's transforming power, we have been reconciled to God and to each other. And he wants us to remember also that we are part of God's tremendous purpose, unification for the whole cosmos in Christ. But before we leave chapter 2 of Ephesians, just a word. Paul has outlined to us that God has made us alive in Christ, those who were dead in sin. 
and he has made one in Christ those who were divided. Outside of Christ, nothing but death and division. But in him and through him, we can know life. We can know peace. We can know unity with God. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be a Christian? Let us pray. Therefore remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Father, we thank you for bestowing on people like us tremendous privileges like these. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is number 452. 452. Yes, finished. The Messiah dies.
And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we think or ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.